Hey guys, I hope you're doing well. Um, I'm gonna do this real quick. Uh, like I said in my email, I've it's been a pretty busy week, so I'm just gonna jump into this. Um, please don't make fun of my shaggy costume. I was shaggy for school today, so. Uh, first question is, when planning to differentiate for students that need supported and challenged, do you typically determine ahead of time who may need supported and who may need challenged and have them perform different tasks? Or do you have everyone start off doing the same activity and assess how well each student is doing to meet their needs from there? This is a really good question. And it's something that you do a little bit of both. So halfway through the year, you're really going to know what kids are going to struggle with certain kinds of things and maybe what kids struggle regularly. And then you can start to set yourself up before your lesson for the kids that may need help, the kids that maybe I can give these jobs to, um, and different things like that. Uh, but at the beginning of the year, I feel like it's really important for you to start off with everybody on an even playing field and then go into maybe meeting their needs individually. Uh, an example from my classroom, probably top 10 most successful lessons I've ever taught. Uh, we were doing um, a hands-on inquiry-based project and kids had to build, um, they had to build gliders because we were working on aerodynamics and forces in an OGT prep class. And this class had kids of all ability levels, um, kids that were super successful, National Honor Society kids, and kids that really struggled in the classroom. And I selected some kids um, and gave them specific jobs. So my kids that I knew weren't super into the project, maybe they were a little more socially backward, I let them be the recorders. Um, and then I had another student who really struggled academically, but he was great hands-on. I let him do all the measuring. And, you know, I had another kid video because that's something they were into. And it really worked out because every kid in this class was engaged in the lesson. And I gave them jobs at the beginning that I knew they would be successful at rather than looking at, oh, I think they're going to struggle. I was setting them up for success. And I think that that's the most important thing because success breeds success. And when you have kids that struggle daily in the classroom, they're not going to be engaged in your classroom. They're really going to kind of sit back or maybe come in with negative feelings. Uh, but if they are doing something that they're interested in, they're really going to get into it and everybody really enjoyed it. So um, the next question, how much do you integrate text reading into class? Do you use a lot of it or do you focus on your lecture? Okay. There were different lessons for different groups, and I changed specifically based on the groups of individuals I had every period. So some kids I was able to do like a flipped classroom where they would read the text the night before, and we would just go into open discussion. I was never really a lecturer. I liked to have classes that had open discussion and I could talk with my kids and get their input on how they see things, answer questions, kind of like what I do with your weekly questions here. I think that we learn so much more from a conversation than we do from sitting and listening to somebody. You, when you're engaged, you retain. So you aren't always engaged in a lecture, but more often than not, you're engaged in a conversation. If I did have to integrate text into class, it was in small, small pieces. Um, I like to think of uh, Sunday morning sermons where you have a small text passage that you read at the beginning so everybody knows, and then you dive into the actual sermon. Uh, it, you wouldn't want to sit in a sanctuary on Sunday and listen to somebody read an entire chapter of the Bible that probably wouldn't be the most enjoyable service. So when you think about a classroom, it's probably not going to be the most enjoyable class to sit there and listen to somebody read an entire chapter of a textbook. It's going to be pretty boring. 
Next question, what are some ways you incorporate technology into the classroom? I let kids make projects. Uh, we did web quests where they had to create their own web quest and then students had to do the web quest in a different group so they would exchange web quests between groups. Student videos are uh, another way that I allowed students to use technology in the classroom. I showed video clips. I used um, different sort of quizzing softwares and applications for reviews and stuff. Uh, another way that I incorporated technology, um, just basically using a smart board every day, using the slideshow, you know, slides, pictures, um, having visual aids in my classroom. I think that that's really important. Uh, now that we are in the COVID era, incorporating technology into your classroom is not going to be difficult. Every kid is going to have some sort of device. A lot of schools, oh, excuse me, a lot of schools are going hybrid. So it's really important that you guys embrace the technology, but still find a way to humanize it. It's very easy for people to just throw all of their content onto the computer and then have their kids open up the computer when they walk into the classroom and do whatever online module they have to do right now because they've put everything online. And that takes away a lot of the social emotional learning and the interaction that we get from schools, which I think is part of the hidden curriculum that is most important for us because Really, the main thing that school teaches us is how to interact with each other and how to survive in society. Those are the lessons that we take into every job. So make sure that when you are incorporating technology into your classroom that you still find a way to humanize it. Finally, what are some methods we can use to make students that are insecure about having IEPs feel as though it's okay to receive extra help in areas they struggle? So the first thing you have to do is allow them to infiltrate the rest of the class. I always did assign seating in every class because it never fails. Kids that are used to having problems all kind of sit together and kids that are used to being successful all kind of sit together. And, oh, sorry. What um, assigned seats do is they allow you to A, help maintain a level of interaction between your kids where they are interacting with new people and not the same group of friends all the time. But they also help in classroom management because you can take maybe a group of kids that are a little more engaged in social conversation and split them up and put them by kids who are really into your class. And that will help you reduce the number of distractions in your class. And then what you do is you go around and you check with every student. You check with every student, help every student out that you can. And don't just say, does anybody have anything? Walk around, be mobile in your classroom. Go check with kids, say, hey, I see you're not doing this part. Do you need help? And don't make it an IEP thing. Don't make it a learning disability thing. If you are there to help everyone and you provide everyone with assistance, then that stigma of being the kid that gets help kind of goes away because everybody's getting help the same way. And then, you know, maybe you have certain kids go work in a group back here with this kid who you know is really strong and they can accept help from their peers. And maybe that's a little bit easier for them to swallow. So those are some ideas for how to do this in your classroom. I hope that you guys are doing well. I um, hope that you have a safe Halloween. Please stay safe and God bless.